Gut, nachdem wir jetzt auch noch Skane hatten. In der Maschine schwingt die Energie tausender Seelen mit. Neben ihr stehen, zu stehen lässt ein Schwindelgefühl in dir aufkommen. Gut, dann beenden wir das Ganze jetzt. Wenn wir dürfen. Mit deinen Gefährten als Augenzeugen begibst du dich auf, dich auf die Stelle, wo vor langer Zeit Taos vor seinen Leuten stand. Die große Maschine liegt untätig und betriebsbereit vor dir. Du hast die Maschine und andere wie sie im Betrieb gesehen. Du verstehst ihre Funktionsweise. Es ist ein Apparat zum Umleiten von Seelen. Für einen Wächter wäre es ein leichtes, die Umleitungsrichtung zu beeinflussen. Doch angesichts der Größe der Maschine könnte es das Letzte sein, das du tust. Sprich den Befehl. Als ich die als ich alte Zahnräder locker, lockern und zu drehen beginne, hörst du ein kreischendes Malgeräusch von Stein auf Stein. Die bleiben nur Sekunden, bevor die Seelen in die Adra-Adra geschickt werden. Dies ist deine einzige Chance, sie umzuleiten. Ja, ich könnte sie in den Reinkarnationskreislauf schicken, das wäre Berat. Ich könnte sie in die Körper zurückschicken, Hiela. Die Seelen entropisch auflösen und ihre Existenz beenden, Rümgrand. Die Existenz auf... Essenz auf die im Dürrwald befindlichen Seelen verteilen, um sie zu stärken, ist ähm, Galloway. Die Seelen gestatten, durch die Erde zurück zu Vuidika zu gelangen. Das wäre äh, Dings Gain. Die Seelen zu einem unbekannten Ort zerstreuen. Das wäre Whale. Wir halten uns aber daran und nehmen Jela. Du schließt deine Augen und erweiterst deine Wahrnehmung nach außen. Du nimmst die immense Gesamtheit zehntausender Seelen auf, die um die Kammer kreisen. Du hast die Seelen kaum im Griff. Bevor dir bewusst es bewusst wird, musst du kämpfen, um sie alle unter deinem Einfluss zu behalten. Und als die Maschine an Geschwindigkeit zunimmt, kannst du spüren, wie sie deinem Griff entgleitet. Ein kurzer Moment lang fühlst du sie an, als hättest du sie alle gleichzeitig im Griff. Und ihre Kraft ist derart stark, dass sie dich zu zerreißen droht. In diesem Moment widmest du dein ganzes Wesen der Änderung des, ihres Umlaufs und lenkst ihren Fluss in eine neue Richtung. Und willkommen im Epilog. Your command, the ancient device became your instrument, spinning to life with deafening resonance and gathering up the swirling essence like thread on a great spindle. There, in the pale pulsing glow of the machine that set you on this path long ago, you summoned all your strength, focusing on your objective and blocking out all else. With a single concussive blast that rocked the chamber and sent you tumbling to the ground, You freed the souls from their stasis. Exhausted, your consciousness slipping away, your last sight was of the machine, dark and dormant. Then your eyes closed, and sleep welcomed you at long last. After coming to and searching for some time, you discovered the route Theos used to enter Sun in Shadow, and embarked on a long and arduous ascent back to the surface. You emerged in Ter Evron after days of tunneling through the rubble Theos had left behind. And when you stepped into the daylight, you were faced with a different Deerwood than the one you had left. At your direction, the souls diverted by Theos were guided back to the vessels originally meant for them. For the first time, parents of hollow-born children woke to the cries of their infants and looked into their eyes to see them staring back. People fell to their knees where they stood, thanking Helia or Magrin or even Aethus for their forgiveness of whatever guilt they felt they bore. But for all the relief that had come to some parents, others only found new grief. For many thousands of Hollowborn had died during Wideone's legacy, many by their parents' own hands. For those children, there would be no homecoming. Yet the last Hollow birth was in the past now, and those parents willing to risk trying for a new child were frequently rewarded, often with twins. Many felt they saw Helia's hand in it, and the year would be remembered as the year of Helia's splendor. Gilded Vale remained under the harsh rule of Lord Radric, who reigned unopposed after the death of his cousin Kolsch. He continued to terrorize the people of Gilded Vale, looking for Aethasians in their midst. But to Radric, The sudden and unexpected end to Wideburn's legacy came as a sign of the success and righteousness of his efforts, and in time, his own people came to believe it too. He relaxed his use of authority, no longer seeing his own people as potential threats, and Gilded Vale began to regain some of its old luster. Following the assassinations of Duke Avar Wolfgren and Lady Webb, 
Defiance Bay was thrown into political upheaval. In the ensuing weeks, the streets had become the domain of looters and blackguards. Few dared to step outside their own doors alone or unarmed. But order was soon re-established by the Knights of the Crucible, who, despite their depleted numbers, had gained favor in the public eye for their role in the unraveling of the conspiracy surrounding Widewind's legacy, and were quickly reinforced by returning forces from Fleetbreaker Castle. For the Knights, their resurgence marked a return to the tradition as well. Having seen firsthand the dangers presented by dabblers and animancy, the Order quickly abolished the practice internally, preferring the familiarity of their hammers and forges to the uncertainties of Essence and Adra. Their identity rediscovered, the Knights suppressed their political aspirations and began once again to train their recruits in the art of blacksmithing, recapturing the post-revolutionary ideals of Deerwood and regaining the respect of its citizens as a result. The destruction of the machine atop Terra Noaneth spelled the end of the reanimated corpses in Heritage Hill. Though at first few were willing to venture into the abandoned district, it was soon cleaned out and rebuilt. The district's horrors still fresh in people's minds, it would be some time before it was fully repopulated. But eventually the lure of cheap prime land would all but erase the memory. The Duke's assassination at the apparent hands of an Animancer had caused catastrophic rioting in the streets of Defiance Bay, and few Animancers survived the first day. Many Deerwardens took the end of Widewind's legacy as a sign, both that the gods did not approve of Animancy, and that the purging of Animancers in Defiance Bay had been enough to satisfy them. In time, their rage would subside, and a number of surviving Animancers remained in and around Defiance Bay, often taking to the wilds to practice their science without repercussions. The town of Deerford had seen the last of the Cult of Scan. Dark rumors about the town's many curses quickly faded, and travelers soon returned. Abidun's renewal brought new vigor and purpose to a god long known for quiet, steady labor. Handicraft saw a revival in the Deerwood, and no smith wanted for an apprentice. Additionally, Abidun's restored interest in preservation led to redoubled efforts to survey Ingwithin ruins. Anamancers and craftsmen alike found much to study, but tensions with Air Glanfoth rose. As for Stalwart, the Battle of Caron's Scar only strengthened their resolve to unlock the mysteries of Durgan Steel and build new marvels with the White Forge. However, Stalwart's ambitions brought them into further conflict with the Raid Serens, as more and more impoverished communities gathered at the border and vowed to finish the work of the Iron Flail. It would be many generations before the region saw peace. The Flames That Whisper clan found a cautious peace with Stalwart, particularly once the villagers heard of the aid the ogres had offered against the Eyeless. The clan moved back into the russet wood, and as Stalwart grew in prestige, the villagers formed a tighter alliance with their ogre neighbors. Within a generation, ogre traders visited Stalwart, and village hunters were welcome in the russet wood. Harmka's death had brought the Devil of Carrick little satisfaction. In time, her taste for vengeance soured. What replaced it was a hunger to feel something, anything, new. Summer had thinned the snowpack twice over when she felt the joint at her elbow first begin to stiffen. She turned her back on the hopes of animancy and civilization and walked east. She pushed through the mountains, past Raid Ceres, and into the broad plains of Isha Middle. She had forgotten what it was like to simply journey, no goal or destination in mind. Though she felt nothing more than the steady thump of her feet on the road, the endless horizons and grassy meadows were new to her. She measured her time in the gradual rusting of her body and was satisfied. Her movements slowed, but so did the world around her. Waist-high grasses undulated and tacked in the wind, as gradual as the tides. Sparrows and black jays made steady pilgrimages across the sky, each flap of their wings a solemn salute. She could hardly move when she found something she had never seen before, the ocean. With the last of her strength, 
she pulled herself beneath the water, content at last to feel the movement of currents and the constant caress of the waves. Sawa came to believe that the Takan had survived through him. He returned to Ishamital, where he united a number of small, vulnerable tribes under the beliefs of his people. He called them Takanakin, kin of Takan, and under his tutelage, they became strong enough to resist would-be conquerors. Zawa taught his secrets not to one chosen person, but to all, that the line of knowledge might never be broken. Once Maneha had made peace with her memory, she decided the time had come to face her more recent past. For the first time in decades, she returned home to Rawatai, and she found that it had changed as much as she had. New districts had sprung up along the coast, while others withered into crumbling husks, and the streets had changed their course as surely as rivers. Her parents wept with joy at her return. They still ran the old spice shop, and in its many aromas and flavors, she found memories of the places she'd traveled and the people she'd known. She told her story, bottle by bottle, and began to build a life on the soil she knew best. The fortress of Cadnua emerged as a bastion of security in the midst of an untamed land, becoming the envy of every thane and earl in Deerwood. Legend grew over time of its impregnability, and stories of formidable invaders easily scattered by the Keep's defenses became popular around the hearths of Deerwood and Inns. Likewise, it also became a beacon to travelers, merchants, and visiting dignitaries alike. Reputed as the finest fortress in all Deerwood, people would journey from near and distant lands alike to experience its fabled hospitality and grandeur. After the death of the Master Below, a strange quiet fell over the endless paths of Ad Nua. The attacks on the fortress above ceased, Ad Nua's silent titan the closest remaining thing to a Master in its musty, forgotten passages. Pelagina had gone against the Duke's Bell's orders by inventing a new trade arrangement with the Anamenfath to accommodate the recovering Deerwooden market. With the Deerwood's people still weakened by Wideman's legacy, the Valian Republics easily pushed their would-be competitors out of the market. For her outrageous insubordination and audacity, Pelagina was banished from the Republics. She traveled north in the Eastern Reach, avoiding Valian ports and entering the ranks of the kind wayfarers. Despite her bravery and dedication to those in her care, her strange appearance made her feel like an outsider wherever she went. With your business concluded, Heravius quietly took his leave and headed home to Thane Bog. The elders of the Fisher Crane had not warmed to Heravius in his absence, and when he arrived, he was denounced and scorned. Horavius spoke of his deeds and of his communion with Galloway, yet none would support his petition to return to the tribe. One by one, starting with the oldest, Horavius challenged each member of the council to single combat, humiliating the Riau in a series of savage duels. With half the council bloodied and shamed, the elders at last acknowledged Horavius' strength, announcing him a hunter of the Fisher Crane tribe. Upon being granted this title, Horavius calmly left the village and embarked again on his life of wandering. Adair chose not to return home to Gilded Vale. Through a number of quiet inquiries, he soon found his way into the underground organization of Aethasians known as the Night Market. Ironically, in learning that the gods had been fabricated, Adair found his faith in Aethas renewed, and that his god was neither alive nor truly a god had become irrelevant. He rose quickly through the ranks of the night market for his optimism and for his bold leadership, his ultimate goal to make the Deerwood a place that would welcome followers of the Shining God once again. When the dust settled in Sun and Shadow, Aloth looked upon the remains of Theos Ixarchanon, his former master. He saw where the Grand Master had gone wrong and what would be required to undo the harm Theos had wrought. With a flick of his wrist, he burned Theos's robe, headdress, and every other symbol of the man's power. Never again, he vowed, should Kith live in fear and blind obedience to an authority they did not understand. Armed with the knowledge and courage he had gained on his journeys with the Watcher, 
he set out on the long and lonely task of dismantling the leaden key. With both their aims fulfilled, Kanarua bid the Watcher farewell and sailed back to his beloved Rawatai. There, he reported on his findings to the Lore College. Kana spoke of the Ingwithan people, describing both their vile experiments and their inspiring accomplishments. He spoke too of the destruction of the tablet by the Leaden Key and the group's efforts to erase the Ingwithan legacy from the world. Both inspiration and cautionary tales, he said, could be found in the world beyond Rawatai's borders. Kana urged his people to continue to pursue knowledge abroad so that the lessons found there might benefit Tekoa. Kana's inability to prove his theory of Ingwithan influence diminished his academic standing, but his passion drew much interest from those less concerned with degrees. Kana swiftly became an influential figure in the move toward a more collaborative approach to expansion on the northern continent. In his personal life, he came to enjoy the reputation of an affable eccentric, willing to share grand and impossible secrets along with a drink and a song. With Thales defeated and the souls released from sun and shadow, healthy children were born once again in the Deerwood. The grieving mother sought a place where she might do penance for the birthing bell. She returned to Deerford where, to the astonishment of the villagers, she delivered the first healthy child in over a decade. She remained there and with each new birth, she saw a measure of hope restored to the Deerwood and a measure of grace for her own troubled past. Durance used Magrin's strength only until Theos had been cast from the world and then swore off her influence entirely. Regret came to weigh heavily on his mind, and a man who had never previously lacked for words or opinions came to embrace silence and contemplation. He continued to wander, penniless and destitute, searching now not for the reason for his goddess's silence, but for a mechanism for revenge. The charred robes he continued to wear as a reminder that he had been burned by his goddess, and not just by the flames of the godhammer. Sagani experienced the four months of her journey back to Masuk in vivid colors. She strove to memorize every moment of her final trip through the Deerwood, Erglonfoth, the Valian Republics, and beyond preparing to tell her village of what she had seen on her long journey. All of Masuk shared in her triumph, and she felt her pride and elation magnified by the joy of her village. Never again did she doubt the value of her sacrifices. After decades as a long hunter, Sagani finally became one of Masuk's most respected elders. She guided her community with wise counsel, and a generation after she finally passed, Another huntress journeyed into the world to find her soul. For you, the death of Theos brought an end to your waking visions and a silence to the whispers of the past. In their absence, you were able to sleep. The questions of a distant lifetime ceased to trouble your soul. All that remained was what to make of the answer. But at the moment, there was little to be done and the matter would have to wait. A long journey loomed ahead. Ja. Und das war Pillars of Eternity. Unser zweiter Playthrough, unsere zweite Staffel. Inklusive White March. Ja, Abschlussworte. Zum Spiel selber brauche ich nicht mehr viel zu sagen. Das habe ich schon bei meinem ersten Let's Play. Ich mag das Spiel immer noch, auch wenn es so seine kleinen Problemchen hatte, die ich hier und wieder mal angesprochen habe. Äh, zum Ende jetzt... Äh, kann ich mit gemischten Gefühlen gegenübersehen. Manche meiner Kameraden haben nicht so das Ende gekriegt, was ich für sie erhofft hatte. Und auch allgemein so <lacht> scheine ich ein bisschen mehr Unruhe in der Welt verursacht zu haben. Gerade was Stalwart und Goldtal zum Beispiel angeht. Aber ich wollte einfach mal die anderen Alternativen sehen. Und ich hoffe ihr auch. 
Ja gut, wir skippen die ähm, Credits. Weil viel mehr habe ich jetzt dazu nicht zu sagen. Es geht ja dann demnächst mit Pillars of Eternity 2 dann weiter mit unserem Charakter. Und der zweiten Staffel davon. Dann werden wir sehen, was für Auswirkungen das bis jetzt hatte. Das Einzige, was ich jetzt noch sagen kann, ist, dass ich euch fürs Zuschauen danke. Und dass ich hoffe, dass ihr bei den anderen Let's Plays und bei der zweiten Staffel von Pillars of Eternity 2 auch wieder mit dabei seid. Deswegen jetzt hier zum Abschluss ein frohes Hi-Ho. Danke fürs Zusehen und bis zum nächsten Mal.